Welcome, everybody. My name is Jim Doolin Bacchus. Thanks for tuning in today uh, for our fireside interview with Joel uh, Montanelli. Is that a Montan? How do you pronounce Montano. it? Montano. Montano. Yeah. Sorry. Well, like, there's like, two ways. Like, there's, there's the true way, which is Montagnel. That's Montagnel. the Filipino way. And then I okay. the Americanized way is Montano, like Daniel with a T. Montana, let's see. Got it. Okay. So, uh, everybody, thanks for coming. Introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, you put your title, location, your company. If you have any questions, drop them in there. Uh, we're going to interview Joel through the, through the whole time. And at the end, we'll allow you guys a few questions uh, directly to Joel. Um, and uh, for those of you that are new to Entra, Entra is a social network for entrepreneurs. Uh, we're here to help you connect, collaborate, and share resources and knowledge. Uh, our app is out. Uh, this app is a social network, kind of like LinkedIn, but specifically for entrepreneurs. So you can find some amazing entrepreneurs and collaborate on some great projects. Uh, I'm going to drop in the links for everything here. And also, I'm going to drop in uh, Joel's LinkedIn if you want to connect. Is that the best way to connect with you, Joel? Yeah, that, that's great. Or uh, Joel at sevenrooms.com. Perfect. Awesome. Number seven spelled out. And then you have, um, then we also have, if you want to join the app, you can join it at joinentra.com. We have an iOS, web, and Android. So you can join either platform, whichever works best for you. Uh, so Joel, CEO of Seven Rooms. Seven Rooms is a fully integrated data-driven guest experience platform for hospitality operators. Joel, welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be on. Awesome. And um, I always like to begin the interview by discussing your journey. And I like to begin in the beginning, right? Like kind of your childhood growing up. Is there anything in your childhood that, that kind of spark that entrepreneur spirit or was it later on in your life that it appeared in your life? I think it's always fairly entrepreneurial uh, growing up. So, you know, the way my mind works is just, you know, looking at something and then trying to understand why it works the way it works. And then in some cases, uh, figuring out how to make a business out of it. Uh, maybe it was partly driven by, uh, you know, my, my desire, I think early on to buy basketball cards, you know, or video games, uh, things that, you know, your parents uh, wouldn't really give you that much money for, at least my parents didn't really give you that much money for that stuff. Uh, so from pretty early on, I had to find ways or I wanted to find ways uh, to make extra money. And the way that I thought about it is, uh, could I figure something out about a model or a way of doing business and could I do it differently uh, and in some cases make some money out of it. Uh, so I had various businesses growing up, uh, little side hustles, if you will. Uh, you know, one example of that just simply is, uh, you know, back in high school, uh, CD burners had just come out and, uh, you know, you could, you could, the CD burner was like, I think maybe 150 bucks. The CD-ROM things, the discs that you burn on, uh, were maybe $10 for a stack of 10. Uh, so I created a business where back in the day, uh, you know, you would buy a CD, which had 12 songs, and you really only wanted one song. Uh, so this is at the same time, like MP3s were coming out. Uh, so I just started something where, you know, you could give me your 10 songs that you really care about for $20. I'll burn them on a CD for you. And so, you know, that's one of the ways I picked up money pretty quickly. Another small oh. thing. <laughs> yeah, got Joe, right. we'll edit this out because I know that's yeah. not legal, what you probably were doing. <laughs> but <laughs> I, have a, I have a similar story when I was in high school. Same thing. I got a, a friend of mine has CD burner. I found somebody that was selling the CDs in bulk. And somehow through a friend of a friend, I got Eminem's uh, album before it came out, like a week before it came out. I don't know how. And we burned, we were burning CDs through the night because in school they were, everybody wanted them. Yeah. Yeah. We must've made, I don't know, 150 CDs and we, we made a ton <laughs> of money and, you know, it paid for prom and I it was probably a senior. I don't even remember, but uh, yeah, I, that's awesome. That's a, such a, that's a great story. That's uh, it's, I thought I was the only one doing it, but I guess. Yeah. It's like, little, you know, little stuff like that. And I think, you know, kind of find, you know, I'll give you one that you don't have to edit out. So, uh, even my, 
first job out of college, uh, you know, in training class. Training class was kind of boring. Uh, so I figured out actually that you could sell stuff on eBay. Um, and what I found actually is people are generally pretty lazy. I don't know why. Uh, but I created a dropship business where I would just list refurbished Apple products on eBay. Uh, you could buy them on the Apple site. I would price them 50 bucks higher than the Apple site. Um, and just whoever would buy them from me on eBay uh, make the spread and there's no risk there. Uh, and you know, quickly just doing nothing, you make pretty good money. So there's so many opportunities like that where you know, my, that's just how my mind works is uh, can I find an opportunity that, you know, makes sense and, and everyone can kind of win. But yeah, so anyways, long story short, always been fairly entrepreneurial. Less so, it's really less about the money. It's more so just, I like the fact that uh, there's opportunities like that, that you can find that, you know, you know, and kind of change the way things are happening. Oh, I agree. And, and I think a lot of times I think about does money drive entrepreneurs? And, and I think it interests you, you know, cause you're like, wow, I can make money. But then once you, you realize like when you're up at one o'clock in the morning working on it, it's, you're not getting paid for that time. Right. So it's really not the money. And it's really about just trying to figure out the problem. And then when, yeah, you, that's exactly right. And when you make the money, it's the validation of like, Oh wow, that's the bonus. Right. But we do need to make money to live. And that's a whole other topic of entrepreneurs that, you know, are struggling because they can't make enough money. But is there anyone in your life early on that played a role in, in not mentoring you, but maybe kind of just like piquing your interest in what this was? Or is this all self-driven? Hmm. Going back in time. I think fairly self-driven uh, after, you know, after my first job, definitely there were um, and are still mentors that really have shown me the way which I'm sure we'll get into uh, early on though. I think just natural kind of knack of trying to figure out why something works the way it works and then trying to come up with a better way to do something uh, and seeing pretty early on that sometimes the stuff you come up with actually did work and then getting more confidence or, or finding more problems to solve that were interesting. Uh, so yeah, I think early on self motivated and then later on uh, being able to uh, leverage other folks and, and their, uh, their perspective. Awesome. And so uh, these businesses, you started them in high school, college, right? You had several different businesses. Um, you get to college, what do you do in college? Like, are you going, are you, are you studying something? Like, are you, are you built, are you, did you figure out you're going to do this, not this career, but there was another career path that you were going to take? Yeah. So I had a really interesting college journey. And I think if someone looked at my college journey, uh, it would make no sense where I am right now. And that's also, I find that also interesting. So I started college uh, wanting to become a doctor and I was an English major that was pre-med. Uh, so you had the science and then you had the, the kind of more artsy together. Uh, I always struggled at the science part. I had to work really hard at it. You know, I did all the classes, but it always came, never came natural to me. And I have a family of doctors and everything. So that was a, one of the professions that was approved uh, by my parents, essentially, in their minds at least. Uh, but I knew I didn't love it. And I always had this business sense, like this business knack, I guess. And so uh, the, my junior year, uh, one of my roommates uh, was telling me about investment banking. And I was like, what's investment banking? He's like, well, it's this and this and this and this. And he goes, you should just apply uh, to it. So I uh, was still pre-med, still had every intention I ended up uh, getting an internship at Credit Suisse uh, summer before my senior year. Uh, I ended up living with my great aunt at the time, uh, who was a retired doctor. Uh, we had lots of good late night conversations and she gave me a lot of life advice. One of the things she told me was, you know, medicine isn't the way it used to be. Uh, it's really changed because of Medicare, Medicaid, insurance companies, it, it, and it's hard to spend the time you want uh, to get to know your patients and really develop the human relationship with them. 
And for me, that was really big. When I thought about medicine, that's what I wanted to do. Uh, so coming out of that summer, uh, I had a full-time offer uh, to go into finance at Credit Suisse. And I was sitting in MCAT class and I just, you know, I wasn't putting the time, I wasn't doing the work. And it's the first time where I really followed my gut to say, you know, your gut's telling you, don't do this, you don't love it. Uh, so I made the decision after doing all the pre-med classes, being in MCAT class, uh, to say, look, I'm gonna go into finance for at least a couple of years. If I hate it, that's okay. Uh, but I know I don't love medicine. So I had to call my parents up and say, hey, um, mom, dad, I'm not going to do medicine. How did that uh, go? I'd like to hear that conversation. There was a lot of silence on the other end of the phone <laughs> uh, when I mentioned that. So, you know, I think ultimately they've been pretty trusting of me to make the right decisions. And so they, they were supportive. And uh, yeah, so I started down the path of finance. Uh, and then, you know, and maybe there's a little more detail, but while we're on that, this path, uh, I knew I wanted to go start a tech company. I won't go into those details yet. Uh, and then made a decision to basically jump over to tech before tech was even a thing in 2009. Uh, but yeah, I, I, from that moment on, kind of throughout college, I, I decided, you know, to the extent I can, I'm going to trust my gut. Uh, I'm going to go with, you know, what I think I'm passionate about, what comes natural to me. I'm going to bet on that, even if the short term, even if there's a short term, quote unquote, loss or short term risk, quote unquote. Awesome. Awesome. And then you went into investment banking. And what made you transition from that out? Like what happened in investment banking that? Yeah, so I, I was in a, I was in, uh, at a bank when it was an incredible kind of time uh, where I saw the, uh, the height of the market. Uh, and so in 2005, 2006, 2007 in New York, uh, money was falling out of the sky. Uh, banks were making money hand over fist. Uh, I certainly was paid more than I should have been paid. Um, and you were working crazy hours, uh, but I knew I didn't love it. And actually that's where the, the origin of Seven Rooms really started uh, because you, know, you would work these 100 hour weeks and then at eight o'clock or nine o'clock on a Friday, uh, your boss would come over and tell you you had off for the weekend. At that point, you didn't have enough time to have booked a reservation in advance and you didn't know anyone at the restaurant, for instance, to get in, because uh, you never had the time to build those relationships. So it really started there. Uh, in 2008, uh, the market crashed, uh, and you know, Bear Stearns almost went out of business. Uh, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. Uh, there's some behind the scenes stuff that I saw where, you know, I won't go into all the details for lots of reasons, but basically, uh, we were hired to value uh, a real estate portfolio of Lehman's uh, by another bank. And uh, you know, I won't share what we ended up with in terms of the final valuation versus what they had, but long story short, uh, there was someone who was in the group whose parent uh, worked at Lehman and was very high up. And, uh, you know, in many ways, a lot of the fortune that was built vanished overnight because the next day Lehman went bankrupt. And it was a very good lesson to learn at that point where uh, you could make a fortune, but if you're making a fortune doing something you hate, and at some point in the future that gets taken away by something out of your control, uh, what that could feel like. And so that was another signal to me that said, look, you don't love this. Yeah, you can make a ton of money. Uh, but if there's any risk that, you know, you end up 20 years later having hated your job, hated your life, uh, and ending up with nothing to show for it, that wouldn't feel very good. So that, that told me pretty quickly, uh, I need to go pursue my passion. I'd been thinking about seven rooms for quite some time. Uh, and so it really kind of was a good kick in the butt uh, to start moving that way. Okay. So um... What about, so let's transition, I guess, into seven rooms. Um, why did you become an entrepreneur? At this point, you know, you went to medical school, you were investment banking. We, I understand why you're, you left investment banking, but to leave a, a career that you might not love, but you're making good money, to go into entrepreneurship where you have no guarantee, no income, you know, that's a big step. That's a big transition. So, so what happened there? Yeah, so... Uh... We, 
we being uh, my founders, co-founders and myself, uh, we actually ended up uh, taking a less risky path, at least on paper to start. So uh, we decided in 2008, 2007, 2008, to try to build a business on the side. Uh, and the idea was actually a consumer uh, version of you know, making it easier for uh, consumers to go to these types of places, restaurants, at that point, nightclubs, uh, where you don't have to have a relationship, where you didn't have to go 20 times. Uh, so for two years, we moonlit and tried to build this business while we had full-time jobs. Uh, we launched it and uh, it failed miserably. Uh, and so, you know, kind of going back to your question, really, uh, there's just this internal voice. Uh, it's, it's kind of really hard to describe, I guess you can call it your gut, uh, that basically says, this is what's right to go do. You should go do this. And it becomes this growing voice that gets louder and louder and louder and louder. Uh, and it almost becomes so much so that you can't ignore it. And when it becomes so loud, that's when you know it's time to follow it. Uh, and so, you know, it makes it actually a little bit easier to take the risks. Uh, the first step was actually, you know, moving from finance to tech, uh, where the risk is actually, you know, I took a 70% pay cut to go to tech. All my friends thought I was absolutely had lost my mind. Right? And that's just in one year. That's, you know, over the course of 10 years, there's a clear path to make pretty good money in finance, at least at that point. But listening to your gut, knowing that that's what feels right at the moment, uh, felt like maybe one step back, but 10 steps forward to go down the path I actually wanted to go down. Uh, so ultimately, uh, what, makes, what made me want to take that risk or what made me go start a company was that inner voice uh, where basically I had no other choice. Uh, that voice wasn't going to shut up. It wasn't going to stop. Uh, it was, just kept getting louder and louder. And, and uh, you know, at some point, it felt like more of a risk not to go start the business than to stay in that quote unquote stable job. Yeah, and I, I, I think that a lot of people hear their voice, but they ignore it because they're, they're, they don't have the confidence or they're scared of taking that risk. So in your mind, what was the, what was the calculation? I'm going to go do tech. And if it doesn't work out, I can always go back to finance. Is that what you thought? It was one of those things where, and this is where I really value failure. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people talk about failure uh, and they look at the downside of it. And I really look at it as a, you know, it's not a, it's not a new thought. There's a lot of folks that have put this thought out there, but I think it's a, it's a necessary step to get better. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where uh, the more you fail, the faster you learn and the better outcome will be the next time. So because of that failure of the first kind of startup that we launched on the side, it told me a couple of things. It told me, uh, wow, just because you put a lot of time into something doesn't mean the world will care. And that was a really interesting lesson. Um, and the second thing it told me was, I don't know anything about tech. And so it told me, I need to go learn. And that's the reason why I went to go to this tech company uh, because it was a chance to get experience in something that I had no idea how to do. And I also looked at it from the point of view of, if I wanna go build a tech company, why would someone go follow someone with no experience with tech? I wanted to be able to answer the question of whether it was a prospective employee, whether it was a prospective investor, what do you, Joel, know about technology? And I didn't have a good answer in 2009. Uh, so I went to this company called Live Person in 2009, I was there from 2009 to 2011, and the thing I realized, and this is what gave me the confidence to actually go start the company, uh, even more confidence, was in finance, there's an answer. You use a model to get to the answer that someone already has in their head. That's what the analysts are really doing. They're running numbers to get to a number that the managing director thinks is the right number. Usually. I'm, I'm uh, generalizing a little bit more. Uh, but in tech, what I found super interesting is no one actually knows the answer. The one who actually knows the answer is the customer. And if you actually listen to the customer, you'll figure out what you're supposed to do. And it seems a lot riskier because it's less certain, because you actually have to listen. And so my realization when I was at Live Person was the key to success with technology or building something new, I think, is being able to listen uh, and being able to solve that need and just getting lots of smart people in a room that can throw spaghetti at the wall to figure out what to do. And, and there's no answer. 
And so once I realized that there's no answer and you just got to get the smart people behind with a common passion, that's when I was like, okay, I've learned as much as I can learn here. I'm sure I could learn more, uh, but I'm never going to feel better about the answer until we actually get the boat in the water, talk to more customers and have confidence around the problems that we're solving. So this is all fantastic stuff, Joe, by the way. Um, you launched the first beta version, crashed and burned. So uh, before we get into that, actually, I have a question. Where did you meet your co-founders? You met them at the investment banking firm? Uh, one met through investment banking, uh, and the other one actually was one of, is one of my best friends from home. So we had grown up together since we were 10 years old. There's a group of seven of us. Uh, and the first concept, which was a terrible concept, uh, was, uh, you know, woke up and the next day I called Kanesh. And uh, I knew he was a coder. I didn't know how good he was. I, I knew how smart he was, but I didn't know how good he was. And uh, I woke up the next day and I called him and said, hey, you know how to code, right? I have this idea. Uh, it was, again, a terrible idea, but that's what kind of led us three together. And uh, yeah, we've been working on this business or some form of this business together since 2007. Wow, that's awesome. So you, the, the uh, beta version doesn't go so well. What happens from there? Because you've been working on this business and, I, and I've crossed paths with you throughout the years uh, in, in several, because I was in the entertainment business and working with venues and I've crossed paths with you. So you've been around a while. Like you're not a, a new company you're, you're definitely incorporated for at least 11 years, but so tell me about your, why you decided to solve this problem. What was the problem that you were trying to solve? Yeah. So the original problem we were trying to solve was how do you create a great experience uh, for the consumer? That was the original problem. And why do you have to go 20 times to a place to get that great experience? Why is it, why do you have to go 20 times to become a regular? Uh, what happens if you can't go that many times? And why is the experience inconsistent uh, for that guest? And so we tried to solve it from the consumer side and that failed miserably. In doing so, we met with different hospitality operators and that's when we discovered the bigger problem. And the bigger problem actually is the systems we saw the hospitality industry running on, uh, whether you're a restaurant, a lounge, a nightclub, a pool, entertainment venue, the systems they were using to run their business did not have guest data in them. You mean the pen and paper didn't work? <laughs> the pen and paper worked to an extent. And well, actually, that's, that's actually, so that's funny you say that, because it did work, right? It did work to an extent. It did work if that same person was at the door, at the host stand, was the server, was the bartender. Then pen and paper works. But when that person is not there, and what we saw was guest data is stored in the staff's heads, then pen and paper is just pen and paper. And it was so driven by people, not by systems. And so the idea became, well, this is the hospitality industry. Isn't in some ways all that matters how you treat guests, what you know about them, doing the little things. And if you believe that's true, then don't you need the data on who each of these guests are to really make that happen? And so that became the central premise as that's the reason why you had to go 20 times. So we figured we could fix this consumer experience problem actually by starting with the operator system. And if we could build guest data or CRM, and then build everything around it and make it accessible to them when they were in front of their guests, how could that then transform hospitality? How could that then help them make their guests feel at home, regardless of whoever was standing in front of the guest, picking up the phone, answering a note or email? Um, and so that was, yeah, that was the concept that it came from two years of failure uh, and figuring out that actually, oh, hey, all of those operators, remember we looked at their systems to figure out how we would integrate with it. And then when we started really digging into it, we didn't see any data and, oh, okay, maybe that's what we should be doing instead. So let's talk about um, <clears throat> when you started the company. So now you figured out a solution to, to, to the problem. Now you have to solve the problem. 
did you raise any money? Did you guys bootstrap it the first couple of years? Like what was the, the first couple of years after the seven years? <laughs> well, we made, we made a lot of mistakes. Uh, so I'll talk a about a couple of them. The, uh, what was interesting actually is uh, when we went out to go raise money, uh, this was 2011 now, uh, the first investor we met with uh, wrote us a check. And at that time, we should have known that the fundraising process isn't that easy. Uh, we just got really lucky. And it was a finance investor uh, that we got connected to through a friend. And uh, he basically uh, said, look, you know, I made a decent amount of dollars helping people make more money. I don't feel like I'm impacting the world. So this is one of my ways where I can feel like I'm impacting the world. And one of the things that I thought was so interesting was he goes, what do you know about tech? And I had the ability now because I'd spent the time at the tech company to tell them all of the things I had learned. So in the, might have, might have been the second meeting uh, where he said, okay, you guys are raising half a million dollars. Here's the check. And we were off and running. Uh, so things we didn't think about though, just lessons learned. Uh, you know, the conventional wisdom is conventional wisdom for a reason. Uh, we should have raised twice as much money than we raised. Uh, of course, we were aggressive in our assumptions. So things always take twice as long, cost twice as much. That's a general rule. And then also we didn't know about this little thing called payroll tax. And so uh, once we started, <laughs> yeah, like, wait a second. Why is our model 10% off? compared to our actuals, oh, what is that thing that's hitting? So all of a sudden we were already short from where we thought we were gonna be. So uh, really important to try, uh, when you're ready, try to raise as much as you can. Uh, and then, you know, kind of be a little more conservative. Doesn't mean don't be optimistic, but uh, be a little more conservative with, with uh, the length of time things will take and the amount of money you think things will cost. And uh, so you raised the money. Uh, you guys probably took a small salary, I'm assuming, just to kind of pay some bills and stuff for a little while. Yeah, ours was interesting. So uh, we raised the money uh, because we didn't budget appropriately. Uh, we were out of money by month 12. Oh, and wow. at that, yeah. yeah, at that point in time, it just started getting interesting where the business started getting almost good enough to be able to charge people. And so at that point we had to make a choice, which was, do we keep our salaries? Well, actually not keep our salaries. Um, we had one engineer. So there's three founders, one engineer, Kinesh is an engineer, so we had two engineers. And we said, well, there's something good here. We can't raise any more money because we don't have a business yet. So what we decided as the founders is the founders all cut our salaries to zero. We used whatever money we had remaining to pay the one employee. We got to month 17 and month 18, and we actually started having paying customers on the platform. That was enough to actually raise another small friends and family round that kept the business going. Uh, but yeah, it's one of those times where, uh, and this is what people talk about a lot, where you have to have a lot of conviction, feel very passionate about the business because you will be confronted with hard choices and that was one of the first hard choices was, do we continue uh, and pay ourselves nothing? And, and, you know, we're living in New York City, right? Manhattan. So <laughs> it's not it's cheap. Expensive. Yeah, very expensive. Yeah. So yeah, we, we, uh, we ended up cutting our salaries and then, but it was a, it was a great learning moment uh, because you learn what it's like to have your back against the wall and you have to actually get to an outcome. And it forces a lot of uh, decision-making and you know you have to have a lot of confidence around the bet you're going to make because you only really get one bet to make when you don't have that many dollars. And uh, let's talk about focus. Um, how did you focus? I mean, you're building this product. You can go multiple different angles. You know, you have partnerships coming in, and they're kind of pulling you from here, pulling you from there. How did you How did you stay focused for so long? What was What was that? Was the inner voice talking to you? What was what was the method? Uh, just, uh, just the limitations on what we could actually do. Uh, that was one thing that led to the focus. Uh, the other thing that led to focus was our first failure. Uh, we made a, I made a commitment to 
uh, Ali and Kanash, uh, my co-founders, because the first startup we built, we tried to be everything to everyone. And I think part of that is a lack of confidence around what problem you're solving. Uh, you know, there's always another thing you can build. Uh, and actually by building too much, you dilute what you were trying to do in the first place. So the second go around, we had a lot of conviction and a lot of data around the challenges that we wanted to solve, uh, which quite simply were uh, the restaurant or the operator should know more about their guests. So we want to make a bet on building more guest information as one of them. So we knew what problems we wanted to solve and we would always stack rank it and say, this is what we want to go solve. This is why we think it helps the operator. This is the value we think it creates. And when you have limited resources, you can't really pursue everything. So those two factors working hand in hand is what led to the focus. Okay. And so you raised that second round, friends and family, and then uh, you started charging clients, making some money. Did you start hiring any staff? Like what, what, what point did you start kind of scaling the business? Did you raise a third round? Like, yeah, it was really 2014, 2015 is when we started growing a little bit more. Uh, so at that point, we had raised a uh, more traditional seed round. Uh, so I think we raised roughly just ballpark about one and a half million. And at that point, we had paying customers. We thought there was a model. Uh, you know, the Box Group was one of our earliest investors. So David Tish and Adam Rothenberg, uh, they were great. They are great investors. They were really great then in particular uh, because they would make and still do make bets uh, not because other investors think it's a bet to make, but because they have their own conviction, which we thought was really, uh, really great and still think it's really great. So uh, we had raised uh, about a million and a half, maybe it's 1.8 million. We started building the team. Uh, so at that point, we're probably about 10 or 15, maybe going to 20 people. So you're really, <laughs> it looks like you started it at the peak of the economy. The recession hit so you're like literally do you feel like if the recession wasn't here that your business would have accelerated faster to you know to the milestone yeah you ever think about what's, that? what's interesting actually is the recession created some of the early opportunity here's why uh, so when times are good uh, customers will more or less go out and spend more money will line up uh, for places and, and uh, you know, there seems to be this ever flowing uh, customer demand. When times are tough, businesses have to work harder for that customer dollar. And so in the hospitality industry, what became really interesting is times got tough. They didn't have a line of people around the block. They didn't have months long people waiting lists to try to get in. And so it then came down to, you need to more, know more about your guests so that you can create more regulars, more repeat. And then it became a, a, not a nice to have, but a need to have. It became owners started really thinking about their business, uh, started realizing that forever and ever and ever, you're not gonna have a line at the door. Um, and certainly during the recession, that was true. So the recession actually helped us uh, help substantiate what we were trying to do, uh, where, yeah, you could run off pen and paper, but if you don't have a line out of the door, who are you going to call, who are you going to email to come back in uh, when they may not be thinking about you? Uh, you may not have a line out the door, but it's really important that you understand that this is a first time guest. But it's really important that you understand that this guest is a regular from your downtown location coming in for the very first time to your uptown location. And if they don't get good service, they may not ever come back to any of your locations, which was happening a lot more than it should. So that really led to, uh, I think actually not, it was probably a little bit slower in the early days during their session, but it led to a better understanding of the problem we were trying to solve by the customer. Very interesting. And what did you, um, and, and I wanna talk about the current climate, but we'll save that for the end because it, it seems like we're full cycle to an, a different situation, but a similar situation in basically when you first started. Um, let's talk about raising money. Some, a lot of startups uh, in our in our network are are have great ideas and the great teams and everything is set. They have to raise money and, and it's a struggle for them. And any word of advice on how to raise money? Yeah, it's, well, firstly, 
uh, just to reconfirm that it's really hard, uh, you know, despite what uh, you might read about, uh, despite all of the tech crunch stories, uh, just know that there's hours and, and days and years of work uh, that go into making that story a story you read about. Uh, so if you're feeling uh, that it seems to be easy for these companies, uh, the truth of the matter is they all struggled. They all went through really hard times. Uh, in the early days when you're raising money, uh, the investor is really buying the team and the concept to a certain extent. Uh, but the team is, if you talk to most investors, the team, so long as you're playing in a big enough market, uh, the team is what matters most. Because as most people will find out, uh, the concept or the idea uh, is along the right path, uh, but might change. And then the outcome of a business, so long as you're in a big enough market, uh, the outcome will actually be driven by the team. Uh, there's many, you know, for every success story, uh, for every more recently, you know, the Zooms and the Slacks of the world, there were 10 other folks that had that same exact idea around the same time that just didn't execute or make the decisions that those folks made. So uh, in the early days, and maybe we can focus a little bit on about that, it's about uh, being able to clearly show, uh, you know, the strength of the team or the strength of the concept. And someone gave me a framework to think about, which I think is always good. Uh, which is basically like, um, I'm going to butcher it a little bit, but essentially it's like, why this, why now, and why you? And so the why this is like, what problem are you solving? The why now is, why is now the best time to solve it? Couldn't have other people tried to solve this? Like what's changed that makes this a problem that is now solvable? And then why you, why are you better positioned than other people in the world to solve this? And in the early days uh, for early stage companies, it really is as simple as that. When it starts to become bigger, when you, know, you have more data, then it starts to become a, more about the data, the business, the metrics. Uh, and the other piece of advice I can give is, is you always wanna be building a business around the problem uh, you always want to be centered around the customer. Uh, and if you build a business that way, you'll end up building a business that's attractive to investors rather than the opposite approach, which, can, which would be build a business for investors. And one of the things where we've seen play out more recently is a lot of investors, and this is just my two cents, and people might have different opinions. A lot of investors said, grow for the sake of growth. Just grow, grow, grow. Don't worry about profitability. Don't, don't really worry about this stuff, just grow. And all of a sudden, within the past 12 to 18 months, uh, investors started asking more about profitability. You know, when are you gonna become profitable? And for the companies that really just grew, grew, grew without any profitability in mind, they really got stuck. Because for five years, they were building all for growth to try to get that next round, to try to hit that escape velocity. And there's companies that can do that. There's select ones that it is a growth story. It's about winning the market. Uh, but for many companies uh, that aren't growing as fast and have as much market to grow into, uh, you know, those are ones that got stuck, not able to raise their next round because it, all of a sudden the investor mindset and what was important change, which was not grow, grow, grow at all costs, but grow at all costs. And oh, by the way, when do you become profitable? Right. Yeah, absolutely. No, I totally agree. And I, it's, it's, it's weird. It's like, sometimes you're, you're starting a business and you're like, um, you see all these, this, you, all you keep reading about is tech crunch growth and they're, they raise another hundred million, another 50 million. And, and you're like, are they even profitable? Like, are they able to stand on their own two feet? So let's talk about, uh, now scaling the business, right? So like now you have to hire uh, a team. Uh, what was your method on hiring a team and, and how did you build the culture for, for the, for the company? Yeah. So in the early days, uh, you know, we had, we were looking more for generalists and for athletes, you know, uh, we don't have as much money to pay, uh, as other companies. Uh, we don't have the perks that other companies have. So you're really looking for, uh, someone that believes in the mission, 
uh, someone that you know might be looking to step up in their career, take on more responsibility, and they really value the, the mission and the responsibility perhaps more than the title and the pay. And so finding folks that have that makeup or that DNA, especially in the early days is super important because everyone wears many different hats. Uh, and then the founders interviewing everyone, uh, and it's easy when you're smaller and you don't have that many roles, uh, really without having a defined culture yet, really kind of setting the standard for what you want that culture to be. And every person that you bring onto the team uh, is, you know, I, I think about it as ingredients in a soup. Uh, you know, your culture is your people and your people is your culture. They're one and the same. And so thinking that way, uh, being very vigilant about, you know, what are the things that you value? What are the things that you would want represented uh, you know, we tried to hire for those traits and those skills as much as we could. And then the other kind of thing I think about is uh, every set of, we'll call it 10 to 20 people, if you think about rings on a tree, uh, that's your next kind of culture keepers. And so, you know, when you're early, your first five employees and 10 employees, they're doing interviews, they're finding the next set of 10. That next set of 10 are going to be involved in interviews. So, yeah, uh, thinking that way was helpful for us to make sure we maintained a culture. Uh, and then as you grow, uh, what we're starting to value a lot more uh, is specialists and experience. Doesn't mean that generalists and athlete won't work. Uh, when you start to get to certain size and stage, uh, you realize there's a lot of value and experience. Someone who solved the problem 10 times or five times or three times probably will be able to solve it faster and better than someone who hasn't solved it at all. That doesn't mean don't make bets on people. It doesn't mean people can't be really talented, can't figure it out. Uh, but we now know that uh, just because someone's smart and they're a generalist, everything else being equal, someone that's smart and has the experience typically will do better than that generalist. Interesting. I like that. And uh, let's, let's, let's move on to... Um, the current situation you just raised a round, right? Is this your, which round was this that you just raised? Our series B, my boy. Series B. Okay. How did that go? Like how long did that take for you to raise and you know uh, how much was it? Yeah. So we did a 50 million series B. Uh, it was led by Providence strategic growth. And uh, we really uh, started thinking about the round uh, before the end of the year. So that was the good part. You know, we didn't start trying to raise the round during COVID, uh, which would have been really hard. Uh, it took us roughly call it three to four months uh, from start to finish. Uh, that said, uh, for everyone who might listen to this, you know, you want to be building it's the conventional wisdom again, you want to be building your relationships with investors throughout. And what you'll find is uh, you'll click with certain investors. They'll have a thesis, baby, about your space. And really, again, trust your gut. You know, the investors that you seem to click with, the ones that are interested, the ones that stay in touch, they actually are interested. Uh, you actually do probably click. And so when it comes time to raise dollars, uh, those should be some of your first calls doesn't mean don't meet with folks that you haven't built a relationship with, just, you know, you'll know those people better. So long story short, uh, we had built relationships with lots of investors. We ran a process. We ended up closing in May of 2020, uh, the Series B round. Congratulations. I just want to say that. Uh, thank That's you. Fantastic. Um, so now what? what? Now that you've raised your Series B, what's the next steps for, I mean, the next level for seven rooms? So next level is really two things. It's investment in the platform. Uh, that was one of the key reasons for raising capital, uh, where we saw this world of wanting to be a platform uh, that can help operators do more with less. You know, we didn't think that COVID was going to happen. And that was the thesis anyways, to begin with. Uh, COVID, similar to what we talked about with the recession, it actually will end up accelerating the need for the technology. Because now with COVID, 
the world of operators has changed. So delivery and pickup is, was already a thing. It's now three years ahead of where it's supposed to be in terms of revenue. Uh, so it's growing, that, that market segment's growing faster than anyone thought. Uh, operators are still running reservations and wait lists in their in-service business. So now operators are living in a world where they have to manage across all of these different channels. Guest expectations are higher than ever. The ability to hire and maintain staff is lower than ever. And so you're now in this really complex world where customer expectations are really high. The way a customer can interact with you is more complex than ever. Your ability to understand what they're doing and your team to do that is much harder than ever. And so this is where we think the Seven Rooms platform really comes into play to help them do all of those things. So that's one area that we wanted to invest in and we're spending a ton of the investment dollars really doubling down on product. And then lastly, really global expansion. Uh, so one of the interesting things with our business is we've expanded 40% of our customer base is international with London, Dubai, Hong Kong uh, being our three largest markets. We just opened up an office in Australia with a great team there. And so we're finding actually what we set out to solve uh, is a global problem. A restaurant throughout the world wants to better understand their guests, wants to be profitable, wants to create great hospitality. That's true anywhere you are. And so we're finding actually that a lot of global customers or international customers wanted our product just as much. So we said, okay, we should invest, not everywhere, but let's invest and select international markets to really support that growth. I love it. No, I, I agree. I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's a huge problem. And I remember when I first came across your company, I was like, wow, this is great. I, I love it. But I kept thinking that I was dealing with the operators and I was like, they are not going to understand this. This is going to be a, a, a long educational curve, like a learning curve for them. Because, you know, the operators of even successful restaurants, um, it depends on the type of restaurant. If it's a high end, it's part of a large group, then you're great. You can plug in and they already have a lot of systems in place. But if you're dealing with the person that has the two or three restaurants that writes everything down on a piece of napkin, uh, it's not the best thing, you know? And I remember going to a restaurant in Europe and um, I, I made a reservation. I called and I showed up. They had no idea who I was. And I said, uh, and I said, no, my name, and, and they opened up this black book. And this was like a couple of years ago, you know, it's not too long ago. And they opened a black book and they're looking for my name. And I was like, wow. I said, this is like 1995, right? <laughs> and, and they're still operating. So I think what you're, you're solving is a huge problem. And, and look, right now people are going to restaurants they've been trapped in their houses for months and they're going to restaurants expecting a great experience right because it's a special thing now before you went out to a restaurant it was you just going to eat and you're just getting out of the house now you're going it's kind of like decades ago when people used to get dressed up to go out right now it's a thing yeah so um i think i i love it i wanted to ask you i wanted to ask this in the beginning of, of the conversation but i forgot uh what is what is the, the thought behind the name seven rooms? Was mm. six rooms not enough? You decided <laughs> seven? What was, what was it? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we, when we were starting the company, uh, we knew clearly what we wanted to be, uh, but we didn't have the name that reflected it. And what we wanted to be uh, is a technology business that helps businesses build relationships with people that helps them understand people. And we thought back then, uh, technology was really more transactional in nature. Who you are doesn't matter. You know, you're a sale, you're a revenue number, you're a transaction. And we said, well, in hospitality as a, as a starting point, maybe that's all that matters, who you are, how you know this guest, how they know you, what the relationship is. And we said, we want to find a name that encompasses that. So for two months, uh, we listed out names on a whiteboard. Uh, all of them were crappy, all of them were corny, and most of them you couldn't get the domain. And then we stumbled across a theory uh, by Graydon Carter, who's the former Vanity Fair editor, owns restaurants in New York, and it's called the Seven Rooms Theory. And it really inspired the name. And so the theory says this, in New York, there are seven interconnected rooms, each one more exclusive than the one before it. So just when you think you're at the top spot or the best place, 
there's always another room that you don't have access to or you haven't discovered yet. And that really hit the nail on the head. You know, it's not about exclusivity. It's the seventh room is the place you go to where you feel most at home, where you feel most comfortable. And we said, that's what we want to do. We want to help businesses make their guests feel at home. And so, yeah, so that's why seven rooms. Have you ever met him? Did you ever, did you ever talk or about No, this? Not, not yet. We figure it as soon as he hits us up about the name, either asks us to change it or says something that we've made it but he hasn't done anything yet. So <laughs> that's a, no, and, and I think, and I think my mistake in, in being in hospitality, not my mistake was my business model was on creating exclusivity and access for people, creating that experience for them. Right. Uh, when I first started the business, I thought it was just about getting people in a room. And then I realized it's not, it's an actual, if you just focus on the experience, people will keep coming back. And that's what we kept doing, double downing on the experience. And it worked for us for, for a while. Um, and then people wanted access. Uh, so the company that I started was called To Be Exclusive. And, our, and our, the whole company was to create um, experiences by going to uh, third party vendors like Broadway shows, hotels, restaurants, and getting that extra inventory that they're not using and bundling it into an experience. Mm, and, yeah. and we were super early, like it worked, but we, I didn't know back then, this was like 2004. I didn't know about raising money. I didn't know about anything. I didn't even know that people were looking for experiences. I, it was just a hunch. So, you know, we were a little too early and uneducated. We didn't even have a business plan. That's how like, you know, simple our, our strategy was. Um, so let's talk about the current climate. So right now, your, your guts, what, what is going on with COVID in the hospitality industry? What's going on? You have your ear to the ground. You have your partners. What's going on now? Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's a lot of, so I've called it before, I think, uh, a tale of two cities uh, and we're we have an interesting viewpoint because of our the global nature of our customer base and we work with everyone from the ma and pa you know independent restaurant small one all the way to you know multi-billion dollar casinos global companies public companies uh, so we see everything and the the really bitter sad part you know is that Many of the restaurants, you know, I, I think it's somewhere between 30%, maybe 40% uh, here, at least in the States, uh, will go under. And that's, you know, that's really, really sad. That's a shame. Um, and in some cases, you know, I think, you know, while that's tough, it goes back to almost this idea of failure. I think what will happen is the industry is going to have to get up and get back on their feet under a new model. And we really want to help them do that. And so part of the challenge, I think, in the old model is just operators were run, running, excuse me, on a day-to-day -day basis. Every day they're starting from scratch. Every day they're, they're hoping people are going to walk in, that their phone is going to ring, that people are going to put in orders. Uh, but they've been so reliant on third party. They've been so reliant on guests doing the work to see them. You know, it's been a lot about if I just cook the food and provide the service and I get the press release and I'm on the, the eater top restaurant list, I'll be good. But at some point, some of that stuff runs out, right? At some point, the honeymoon period ends and you're just another one of the restaurants that has really good X, Y, or Z. So for them to come out of this the right way, which is a focus on profitability, a focus on doing things that are actually long-term sustainable, they actually need to own their guest data. They need to build direct guest relationships and they need to leverage that data most importantly to get guests to come back to them directly where they don't have to pay a commission. And we know that the most profitable guests are regular guests, are repeat guests. There's all the stats in the world that show, you know, regulars are seven times more profitable. Uh, you make more revenue, it's an 80, 20 rule. And so, you know, that's what's gonna be really important and we believe Seven Rooms is the answer to that problem now, something that we've been working on for nine years. Now COVID is kind of, again, take one industry will take one step back, uh, but from the point of view of emerging with a new model, uh, a new way of doing business, we think that for operators to be successful, it has to be this new way. Otherwise they end up back in the old world. 
and, and what's some new models that you see uh, surfacing? I mean, what, what's like the model of, uh, you're talking about like uh, logistically like how it works? Like, I, I know we talked about the data, but like what models? Yeah, yeah I, th I think more so uh, they can keep running the way they're running. I think it's just now a question of owning their guest data, understanding that's their biggest asset. And that's what they've been working so hard to do, yet they haven't tapped into it, right? So that's, they don't necessarily have to change uh, that they want to offer delivery pickup, that they want to do reservations and wait lists, that they want to cook great food, that they want to provide great service. What they have to change is understanding that all of those things should be ways to capture guest data and they need to find a technology platform. It, hopefully it would be seven rooms, but if they use something else, I don't care because it's a better outcome. I would care that they use seven rooms, but if they don't, that's okay too. Um, where as long as they're understanding that, because if they don't, then they're just running in place. They're starting from scratch again every day. They're not controlling their destiny. They're not driving their business. And you know, people are working too hard in this industry to not have anything to show for it, to not have any assets to come out of it. Um, and they, they should, and, and some restaurants that use those, they do. And those are the ones I think that are, are a little more uh, able to weather the storm. Uh, and I hope that more and more operators with some of our help will realize how important it is to own their guest data and, and leverage it. Awesome. And you're based in New York, right? You, you yourself? Right. Okay. What your because there's been a lot of articles written, uh, including Jerry Seinfeld uh, writing articles about New York. What's your take on New York? What do you think is going to happen to hospitality in New York? I think it's going to have a rebirth. I'm I'm a big believer that uh, New York is is not dead. Uh, I think anyone who says New York is dead, uh, if you think New York is dead, then what does that mean about every other city on this planet? Um, you know, New York has always had that head start. Uh, yes, it's a lot about the people, but New York is so resilient. So I think the next 12 months are gonna be really dicey. Uh, I do think once there's a vaccine that the general population has confidence in, uh, that will help us get back to normal, uh, which will mean more people will come back to New York because of what it has to offer. Uh, and so I think it will undergo this rebirth the same way it underwent a rebirth in 2008. Uh, it was a little bit dreary to be here, uh, but many of the best companies, many of the best new things, many of the best restaurants, many of the best fill in the blank uh, were born out of that period. And so I think we're entering another period that's going to create uh, the next new thing. And I think New York will naturally be a place where more of the next new things will be created and it will draw people back. And lastly, uh, it, it always opens up room for artists. Uh, you know, artists that can't spend as much, that can't pay as much, uh, often they're at the outskirts and that's where the creativity happens. And then, you know, the, the Whole Foods and the Equinoxes move in. Uh, but what you'll start to see is hopefully artists can come back a little closer to center. That, that will then spawn the creativity and the new businesses popping up again. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I, and I remember 9-11, um, a lot of people moving out of Manhattan um, and that, and that, but at the same time, there's like a shift in New York. So like places like downtown Brooklyn, Park Slope, Williamsburg, uh, different areas, Jersey City, a lot of the artists, the, the, the cooks, the chefs, uh, they kind of all went to different parts and kind of started over. Um, but COVID is like international. It's a little bit different. And I think that New York is going to get real estate prices are going to go down. I think a lot of restaurant spaces are going to be empty and landlords are going to be willing to do really good deals. So if you're very good at what you do and you're willing to invest five, 10 years into the business, you can come in at like pennies on the dollar. You can have your own place. It's going to be rough for a couple of years, but once you get past that point, you're going to reap the rewards later. So I agree with you hundred percent. I don't think New York's going to go anywhere. I just think uh, it's going to change. I think that masks are going to become, a, I, I think masks are going to be a normal thing across the, the world for many decades. Every time there's going to be an alert of a pandemic, everyone's just going to mask it up and, and that's what we're going to have to do. So, all right, Joel, um, I know uh, I got a good, good amount of time here with you. I'm going to wrap this up a little bit. Is there anything left 
Is there anything that you would like to leave the audience? Any last thoughts or ideas or strategies? Yeah, just last thought. It comes top of mind. I was talking to someone who's thinking about starting a business. Uh, you know, number one, uh, be more open to sharing, especially when you're early in the journey. Uh, there's a lot of sense of wanting to hold the idea tight to your tight to the vest. Uh, what you'll find actually is the more you share, of course, be thoughtful about who you share and how you share, but it turns out the more you share, the more people want to help you uh, and the faster you'll get to the outcome you're supposed to get to, which is counterintuitive. Uh, the second thing is actually you would be surprised by the people that are willing to help you. Uh, many of that, and this is a you know, great point about why uh, Entra exists, uh, which is every entrepreneur has been in your shoes uh, everyone has seen a lot of the challenges and gone through them. So everyone will have empathy. Uh, and so I haven't found a community as willing to help as other fellow entrepreneurs. So that person you're thinking about getting in touch with, the person you're like, wow, they would be on my top five list of someone I, I really admire. Uh, take a shot and reach out to them. There's a good chance, maybe not all of them, but maybe two out of five uh, will actually get back to you pretty quickly, actually. Uh, because they themselves remember there was a time when they were in your shoes. They reached out to someone, someone helped them. So uh, I see a lot of, uh, you know, paying it forward with entrepreneurs. So don't be afraid to reach out to people that you think might be out of reach because uh, oftentimes they're not and they're willing to help. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree 100%. Um, yeah, I have one more question. Uh, who's your number, who is your most memorable mentor? Uh, most memorable mentor is easy. Uh, it's my boss from Blive Person, Rob Lucasio. Uh, he's the founder, CEO. Uh, he's still there. Uh, he started the company uh, and took it public by the age of 30 uh, and is still running it to this day, you know, 20 years later, a little more than that. Uh, what I learned from him uh, was the work ethic, the level of care, uh, and the ability to actually really think about culture as a leader and invest in it. And uh, I worked for him for two years when I went to a tech company and uh, I saw just what it takes. Uh, he was the first guy in, last guy out. Uh, he cared about every little thing. And this was after he was by every stretch of the imagination successful. Uh, so he definitely is the person that comes to mind when I think about a mentor uh, who to this day is still helping. And, and what's your thoughts on, uh, on a side, side question on that, what's your thoughts on work ethics? Like, what is what is your work ethic? Is it work long hours, or do you base it on production? Like, how? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I probably I probably skew towards the work work long hours. You know, I I, I not the not the thing everyone should prescribe to. I certainly think work life balance is important. Uh, but if I had to call myself out, I, I'm under the uh, Will Smith has a famous video that I watch sometimes, which basically is like, you know, there's. Like, I'm not as talented as someone, I'm not as smart as someone, uh, but you put me on a treadmill with someone and either I'm gonna die on that treadmill uh, or the other person's gonna get off first. And I think about it the same way, which is I'm gonna outwork that person, uh, whoever's on the other side, uh, because I care about getting to the outcome. And that's just always, I, I think how my, uh, that's always been my mentality. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, and I actually saw that video a few days ago uh, did you post it? No, you didn't post it, right? It just, no. it's, it's yeah. random. You mentioned that because I, I saw it on LinkedIn. And I was watching it and I was like, yeah, I've gotten off that treadmill before, before the other guy, <laughs> but, but at the gym, uh, work-wise, I feel like if, um, if the, if, if I'm competitive enough, I like to be competitive. And for me, it's, it's I want to see how far they're willing to go and I go with them. And, and, and sometimes the competition pushes you further you know, then you're willing to push yourself. And I like, I run, I run marathons. I've ran a few here and there. And, you know, you run, a, I, I think of entrepreneurship as a marathon, right? You get all the people, they look great. Everyone's dialed up in the, in the beginning and they're all ready to run. And then they drop out mile three because they, right. yeah. what they signed up for is not what they really wanted. Um, and then you have the midpoint, right? Like 12 miles or 13 miles you start seeing people break down because they didn't train properly. They didn't, they didn't show up ready. Um, but then you have the people that are, that just pile through and they get to mile 18 or 19 and they're almost there. 
but they just collapse and mm-hmm. they can't go any further because again, they didn't train or they didn't anticipate the long, the length of the journey. And then the people that finish, you know, and some people finish slow, some people finish fast and everyone in between. And that's really what it is. It's not a race for time. It's a, it's a journey that you're going to learn along the way. So anyway, uh, agree more. <laughs> so uh, Joel, thank you so much. You've been awesome. I, I really appreciate every, uh, your time here. Um, everyone, thanks for joining. Joel, is there anything else you wanted to say before we jump off? No, I just thank you for putting this together and, you know, the community that you guys are building and the, the mind share uh, is helpful for everyone. So really appreciate it. Thank you. And I hope this was therapeutic for you. Like, you know, just kind of talking about your journey because some entrepreneurs write me the next day and go, hey, that was great. I felt great the next day. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know tomorrow. I'm sure I'll feel good. <laughs> okay, awesome. All right. Thanks a lot, Joel. Have a great weekend. Uh, stay safe and uh, and we'll chat and, and, and be good. Thank you so much. Thanks. Take care.